I was trying to uh, think through what kind of is the underlying main point of this passage uh, that connects all these different things. And they are all connected. And I came across an illustration that I think will be helpful in pointing out uh, that fact. Years ago, there was an evangelist named Monroe Parker. I never heard of him. Don't know if any of you have heard of Monroe Parker, but he was traveling through South Alabama. It was hot. It was humid. Not like it was yesterday for Gravit Day for us. It was nasty. So he's driving through. He comes across a watermelon stand. Decides to stop, get a watermelon. He asks, lifts one up, asks the attendant, how much is this watermelon? And he says, it's a dollar ten. And Monroe reaches into his pocket. He pulls out a dollar. He goes, all I have is a dollar. So the attendant says, that's okay, I'll trust you for it. And so he starts to walk out the door, and the attendant says, whoa, wait a minute, or I guess it was an outdoor setting. So he begins to walk away, and he asks, where are you going? He's like, I'm going to go and eat this watermelon. He's like, well, you forgot to give me the dollar. He goes, well, you said to trust you for it. Well, then he replied, the attendant, um, no, I meant I would trust you for the dime. Then... Monroe Parker says, you aren't going to trust me at all. You were just going to take a 10 cent gamble on my integrity. So what, what I pulled out of this illustration is this, that if this attendant knew Monroe Parker, knew this evangelist, knew that he was a man of integrity, then he would have been able to say, oh sure, yeah, I'll just bring it back some other time. But he didn't know him, he didn't know who he was, and so could not trust that he would bring the whole dollar ten uh, back sometime. So the reason I highlight that is because our passage, three ways, reveals Jesus Christ to us. Over and over again, it's highlighting who Jesus is. But the point of highlighting who Jesus is in our passage is so that you and I would trust in him. Look to him, believe on him, and trust him. In fact, the title of this message that you see in front of you, I am the light of the world, uh, this is the second I am statement, there's seven of them, in the Gospel of John. If you remember, the first one was I am the bread of life. There's the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John are metaphors that Jesus uses to teach us things about himself. So going back in your minds to John chapter 6 many months ago, uh, when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, the idea that Christ was highlighting here is quit seeking after things that do not satisfy you, like bread that you eat and it goes away. Um, instead, those things that perish, they won't satisfy you, they don't give you life. I'm the bread of life. Seek after me that you might be satisfied. Seek after Jesus that you might have true life. Well, this morning... We're going to consider this second I am statement where Jesus reveals some glorious things about himself. And Jesus tells the crowd gathered here in Jerusalem, I am the light of the world. So what he wants to expose to us in view of who he is, we can trust him with everything in our lives with our life now, with our eternity, and we can trust him with abandonment of ourselves as we look to him. So let's jump into our message this morning and start with Jesus is the light of the world. Here in verse 12, this second I am statement, I am the light of the world. Light reveals, light, light exposes, light teaches, light gives knowledge, and light gives life. But as we walk through this passage, we need to remember the context of what the Jews were celebrating. They've been celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if you remember the Feast of Tabernacles, this is where the Jews would gather in Jerusalem to remember being freed from Egypt, right? And so what they did, they would set up booths 
And they would just take and camp out around Jerusalem, celebrating God having delivered them out from under Pharaoh in Egypt. And what would they do in the wilderness but set up booths? And so this was a reminder of God's deliverance for them. But another aspect of the celebration was they had these candlesticks. And they would go in the courtyard and they would light these large four golden candlesticks. It would light up the courtyard. In fact, one Jewish writer said that there wasn't a courtyard in Jerusalem that likely wasn't lit up by candles. Perhaps uh, even as those candles were being lit, Jesus maybe lifted his voice and said, I am the light of the world. Or it could have been the next morning when the sun was rising and beginning to shine light where Jesus started teaching, I am the light of the world. Either way, this is a fulfillment of what God would do with his servant, Jesus Christ. All the way back in Isaiah 42, verse 6, it says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people. Jesus would be given as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. The light of Christ was so bright that the truth he revealed, the knowledge he made known about himself and about God the Father, that it didn't stop with just spreading that knowledge and truth amongst the Jews, but it spread and is spreading over all the earth. Look at what he says next in verse 12. Not only is he the light of the world, but he says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It says, they will walk in darkness. Whoever does not, whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but whoever has the light of life, they will follow him. So listen, because Jesus is the light of the world, he is able to lead us out of darkness. So when you think of light leading, those candles weren't moving in the courtyard. They were stationary. But there was a light that led people after they came out of Egypt. Remember, during the day, there was a cloud, a pillar of a cloud that led the people of Israel out of the darkness of Egypt. But at night, it was a pillar of fire lit up the presence of God leading them out of darkness and into the promised land. And Jesus is, is typified in that. He is the light of the world that brings you and I out of darkness, out of death. And as we follow him, he leads us in his life, in his light. Jesus brings us out of darkness. And in fact, in verse 13 through 18, there's this going back and forth uh, with these Pharisees. And it just exposes that they're still in darkness. They don't understand. And yet Jesus just keeps teaching them and, and putting more and more light before them. In fact, they try to bring up the law showing, hey, we know the word of God. Let us expose some light on you. You can't bear witness about yourself. You're a false witness. And he says, no, you misunderstand. It's two or three witnesses. And guess what? I'm a witness and my father's a witness. There's no two greater witnesses Jesus could have had. But they're in darkness. And so they don't even receive the witness of Jesus or the father. They hate Jesus because they hate the light. In fact, John 1, 4 through 5, John set this up for us so that we would understand Look at verse 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We need to be reminded about that from day to day, do we not? Then look at John chapter 3, verse 19, continuing on this light-darkness theme. And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world. That, that is through the person of Christ. The light of God's truth has come into the world. And the people love darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their works were evil. This is the natural response of man in his sin, dead in his sin and trespasses, to reject the truth of Christ. Why? Because in that condition, we love the darkness. We love our sin. 
The question, though, for us today is what about you? Do you accept the revelation of Christ as revealed in his word? What, what Jesus has revealed about himself, what he's revealed about you, about me, about all mankind, and about our sin. And do you also receive what he's taught that he is our only light to lead us out of darkness? Just as Israel didn't deserve being rescued out of Egypt by God, you and I don't deserve being rescued by Christ, being led out of our sin, but look what God did anyway in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who did what? Who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Beautiful how the Old Testament, it just comes to light in the new, in the person of Christ. God is so much a God of grace. Do not let your sins being brought to light as he exposes them to you. Don't let that stop you from coming to Jesus. He already knows about all your sins. And it's because of his grace and love for you that he is shining his light on your heart, maybe even now about sin in your life that you tolerate, that you give into. But it's not so that you flee from him and cling to your sin, but instead you would flee from your sin and cling to him. Some of you are not reading your Bible consistently. And this may be a reason why. Because when you read the light of God's word, it brings conviction to you. You're saying, yeah, I'm giving myself over to that. I'm doing that. And because of that conviction, because the light of Christ is shining through his word, and you don't like that feeling, and let's be honest, none of us do, so that you shut your Bible. Or maybe church attendance, because when you come to church, you hear us singing truths from the word of God. You hear the word of God read. You hear the word of God preached and it just brings conviction to you and you don't like that conviction. And so what do you do? Perhaps you stop coming. You stop reading. And you're just saying things like, me and Jesus just have a personal relationship. And yet the truth is, is that the light is shining and the darkness that resides still within is fighting against it. And I, and in Christ, in this word, would encourage you. He's a God of grace. Come to him with all your sin, all that baggage. And he is able to lead you out of that darkness. And to follow him and to walk in his light. Secondly, Jesus is in relationship with the Father. So not only is Jesus the light of the world, but Jesus is in relationship with the Father. Look at verse 19 and 20. So the Pharisees, uh, time and time again, learned they could not argue with Jesus. Um, so they go a different route in this conversation. They ask, where is your father? They're not thinking Jesus is talking about the heavenly father. They're thinking like earthly realm here. But Jesus takes advantage of their question to reveal more light about who he is and the darkness that they are in. Look at verse 19. You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So Jesus tells the Pharisees who think of themselves. You've got to realize the Pharisees think, oh, we're the only light for the Jewish people. They need to listen to us. We know the truth. We can lead them to God. We're their only hope. And Jesus is straight up telling them, you don't know me, and you don't know the Father. And if that wasn't bold enough, he makes it clear that if they did know Jesus, then they would know the one true living God. So that's the reality that not only in this time, but today, if one does not know Jesus, they do not know the Father. And if one does know Jesus, they know the Father. Uh, something that's important to point out is the word for know here is not mental knowledge. 
The devil knows God exists. The demons know God exists and that Jesus exists. But they have no relationship with God. They have no love for God. And they are not in a loving relationship with God. The know here is not mere mental knowledge. Rather, to know Jesus is to be in relationship with him. And here's the point. Because Jesus is in relationship with the Father, one must be in relationship with Jesus to be in relationship with God. Jesus will later highlight this in another I am statement in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. It's only through Christ. So the first claim of Jesus is God the Father sent him to be a light to the world, to bring people out of their sin. Now Jesus' claim is that not only does he lead people out of their sin, but also through him, but only through him, are you brought into a relationship with God. Therefore, everyone who wants to be in a right relationship with God must and only go through Jesus Christ. You cannot go through Muhammad, you cannot go through Buddha, you cannot go through Joseph Smith, you cannot go through Chris Wharton, you cannot go through your mom, through your dad. You must go through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. God has sent one light to lead us out of darkness and into fellowship with God. And that one man is Jesus Christ. Imagine in the wilderness, right? They got that fire leading them through the wilderness. And a guy says, you know what? That's a neat light. I would like to develop a different light for people to follow. And I'll tell them it will lead them to God. So he gets a stick and a torch and he lights it up. And he says, hey, that light will lead you. But guess what? This light will lead you too. But Jesus squelches any other way, any other path, no all paths do not lead to God. There's a narrow road through Jesus Christ and every other road leads to destruction. You must go through Christ. Acts 4.12 And there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. It's through Christ and through Christ alone. This is why taking the gospel to Gravit, to Arkansas, to this nation and to all nations is so important because people who have not heard the gospel are dying in their sins. Billions around this world have never heard the name of Christ, but if people only go to the Father through the Son, then that is why we must motivate for missions. That's why we bring missionaries in here, not just so that we hear how your dollars are being used to move the gospel to the nations, but may God stir up from among us to go to the nations. May we give our sons and daughters to the cause of Christ, not just here in Arkansas, not just here and grab it, but raise them up to be mission-minded and go to the ends of the earth with the gospel. Why? Because people are dying in their sins, and there's but one way. They must hear the name of Christ. They must hear the gospel of Christ, but not just them, but everyone here this morning. You must come to God the Father through the Son, and even now, you can turn from your sin that maybe the light of Christ has shined on you and you're like, I, I don't like the sin in my life and I know I need rescue from it. Well, turn from your sin and look to Christ. Trust in him even now. Don't wait for the song of response. You can trust in Christ where you sit even now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's one more thing Jesus wants to reveal as though that weren't enough. There's more glory. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Look at verse 21 uh, through 23. The, that's where Jesus tells the Pharisees that he's going to return where he came from, from heaven. But he tells them that they can't go and, and that they're going to die in their sins. Look at verse 24 with me. I told you that you would die in your sins. 
For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Unless they believe what? That, that he is who he's been claiming himself to be. He is the light sent from God. He's in fellowship with God. That he is the only way of salvation. But not only that, he came from heaven. He's going to return to heaven. So he's not just merely a man. He is God in the flesh. Isn't that what John has been driving home all the way from John 1, 1 through 3? Jesus is God who took on flesh. And unless they believe that, they will die in their sins. First John 5 20 you know you could have preached this entire message from here because the three points of this message are wrapped up in one verse and we know that the son of God has come and he's given us understanding there's the light Jesus is the light he gave us understanding Two, that we may may know him no that's that relationship you must have with him and that we are in him is true in his son Jesus Christ you must have a relationship with the son to to know the father third he is and this is referring to Jesus he is the true God and eternal life back to our passage John 8:28 Oh, I, man, God is the most brilliant writer ever, and of course he should be because he's God, right? Um, he has an advantage that none of us have, but the beauty of what he just keeps highlighting and pulling from that wilderness wandering into this light of the world. Look with me, verse 28. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that i do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the father taught me they they don't believe in jesus but he's telling them when you see me lifted up you're going to understand and when they lift up that son of man again this is pulling us back to what happened in the wilderness when moses lifted up the serpent on the pole for those who are not familiar with this Oh, get familiar with the richness of this glorious picture of Jesus. So Israel was wandering in the wilderness, wishing they had the meat pots back in Egypt. They wished they were back in the darkness and not heading to the promised land. Grumbling and complaining about all the manna burgers that they were eating day after day after day. And so what do they do? Grumble and complain. And what does God do? For their sin of grumbling and complaining against God, he sends fiery serpents venomous serpents when that when they bite the people that venom spreads throughout their body and they were dying and so moses who's another jesus figure in the old testament he he intercedes on the behalf of those who are dying for their sin and god tells him get a bronze serpent so a representative of of the judgment put it up on a pole lift it up and everyone who's been bitten and is dying from these snakes, if they just look. No labor, no work, but trust in the provision of God. And what is that provision? A serpent on a pole. What a display of Jesus. Who was the Lamb of God, who was slain for us, but guess what? He didn't become sinful on the cross. No, it was our sin that was thrown on him so when he went to that cross he became a curse for us and yet remained sinless because god accounted your sin and my sin to him and that's why we see in john 3 14 and 15 and as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so the son of man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life dying in our sins is mentioned three times jesus highlights for these people you're going to die in your sin you're dying in your sins you're going to die in your sins but the good news is is that because jesus is god in the flesh he is able to save us from dying in our sins and he did so by dying for our sins on the cross. This is glorious. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21 with me. For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to be 
sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Back to our verse 30. <laughs> these people got it. They, they see these glorious pictures of what Christ is highlighting and their need of Christ as Savior. And verse 30 says, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. Listen, I want to quickly summarize in three sentences for the, this whole sermon for you. Because Jesus is the light of the world, he can lead you out of the darkness of your sin and into his light. Because Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with the Father, you must come to God through him, by faith. And because Jesus is God, you should believe in him in order to not die in your sins, but to be saved by him. And it's because of who Jesus is. You can trust him with your life. You can trust him with your sin. You can trust him with your death and your eternity. And my pleading to you, and Jesus' is pleading from the text, is that you would trust in him today and always. Let's pray. Thank you.